I'm absolutely delighted that Dean Loren has won the World Championship title. I said at the start that I thought Nepo was going to win. So there you go. The commentator's curse strikes. Um, but as I said, I'm delighted Dean has won. I got to know him in Beale in 2013, where I was the commentator there. And he was always really polite, really candid, and it was quite clear that he was something very special. And then the next year, uh, the Chinese team won at the Olympiad in Tromsø 2014, and that was incredible. His team teammates nicknamed him the Killer um, because he had a fantastic result there. Um, what I'd like to do over the next few weeks is have a celebration of Ding's play. Although I've recorded lots of videos on the channel and I'll be posting a lot of those on the community tab, do check that out. Um, I'd like to look at some games that I haven't covered, going right back to his early career. And I want to start with the game that he played in the Chinese Championship in 2009. This was the first Chinese Championship that he won. He's won it on three occasions. And this was really a breakthrough tournament. So if we look at the cross table here, uh, Ding, as you can see, won with eight and a half out of 11. But what a lineup. Um, we got two players rated over 20, 2,700. Bu and Ni Hua. Uh, Wang Hao was playing. He was second. I mean, this is an incredible tournament. And Ding was only 16. As you can see, his rating, 24.58, way below uh, most of the other competitors in the tournament. So this was truly a breakthrough tournament for him. So I'd like to show you um, uh, at least a couple of games from this tournament. And I'm going to start off with this game against Peng Xiang Zhang. Um, Apologies for my pronunciation. So Ding is playing black, and as you can see, it's a French defence. Now, he did play this in the World Championship match against Nepo. And, well, in against Nepo, it went like this. And they reached, actually, uh, a very familiar pawn structure with these 4 and 2 against 3-3. Three, three. And watch what happens here. This is interesting. Knight f6, bishop g5, and then ding took on e4. So this is quite a popular line for black, particularly when this bishop has already committed to g5. And yes, the French was very much part of ding's repertoire in those days. And theoretically, the whole idea is that if bishop h4... The bishop is actually a little bit sidelined after c5. White, uh, white struggles to get the advantage in this variation. I've played this a few times with black and it is pretty reliable actually. So that's why a lot of players play the bishop back to e3. And the idea is that it looks to prevent black from playing c5. But also white may be able to play queen d2 later on and even sacrifice on h6. So it's quite potentially an aggressive move. Knight d5, that's theoretically the, the um, best continuation. And here the main move is bishop d2, as Nepo once played against Ding, actually. But then c5 and, well, okay, it's, it's a very different game. But Zhang plays here bishop d3. And Ding snapped off the bishop. So we can see that white has the centre and has a lead in development, a very easy development. But black at least has the two bishops. So that's the struggle here. Will black survive as white has a lead in development and quite an impressive centre? And actually, these two met the year before. And here, Ding played e5. And this happened. Well, this leads to an endgame where white is a pawn up. It's a double pawn. And 
white has a very slight advantage. And indeed, Zhang actually defeated Ding in this game, but very hard to convert that position. But still, white is definitely better. But instead of e5, Ding had an improvement ready. He played c5. So striking out at white center, that's good news. e5, and the bishop came back to e7. So white has gained some space in the center. This diagonal is open, and that certainly gives white attacking chances. Queen e2. So the queen looking to step up, and potentially castles queenside as well. And I think because of the the, the threat or the potential that white has to castle queenside, Ding decided to give a check. C3 and then play bishop d7. So obviously that rules out queenside castling. So Zhang castled on the king side, which is certainly not bad. And it makes this queen look a little bit strange on a5, which is why Ding played queen b6, looking in these directions. King h1 is a very understandable move, stepping away from this diagonal. A5. So why is Ding playing like this? Well, I think basically if white exchanges here, then you can see the pawn on a5 has prevented b4, which would just push the bishop off the diagonal. So that's why a5 was played. Now, Zhang did not take here. Instead, he played knight d2. It's a very interesting move. The knight is looking to swing around here, pushing the queen away from this nice square. And I think it would be very risky to take this off um, with, with a rook coming down to b7. So c takes d4, knight c4. So the queen is pushed off its nice square on b6. Queen c7. Oh yes, incidentally, if queen c5, this is an attempt to keep hold of this pawn, but then comes queen f3. Castles, queen e4, using that diagonal. g6 prevents the mate, and then c takes d4. So black has gained nothing by that. So after knight c4, the queen came back to c7, and c takes d4. And bishop c6. Now, if we just look at this from a, a sort of a long-term strategic view, you know, if we were to just remove the queens from the board, then I think I would rather like black's position because it could be possible to gang up on that d-pawn. And that bishop looks very well placed here. Two bishops look pretty nice. But we're a long way from an endgame. White has space. White might be able to use that diagonal. Um, there are, you know, there's an open file here. There's an open diagonal here. You know, it feels like white is going to be able to attack here. And indeed, white goes on the offensive with queen g4, using that space to move the pieces in. And here, Ding actually plays a really risky move. He castles. This looks very interesting, actually. h5. I like the look of h5. This wasn't played. Because if queen takes g7, castles queenside, and suddenly there's pressure on the g-file, the h-pawn might advance. That's decent compensation. And if the queen goes back, well, maybe, maybe the king has to live in the middle for a little bit. Um, but... You know, black has a little bit of play here. It's an interesting position, quite dynamic. But Ding castled. And here, white missed a really interesting chance. Not that there's a winning move, but there's a move which really puts the pressure on black. Can you find it? White play. Cheers, folks. Rook f6. That should be played. Gives white really interesting attacking options. I think 
this I think we can we can forget that you know with a knight coming in here and a sacrifice too much but king h8 and now queen here takes it's actually it's not quite winning for white but it is extremely dangerous I mean black does have the chance to swing this rook across um, and, and it's actually not that clear even rook g8 I suspect that Shang looked at this and thought hmm this is this is a bit tricky you know this could go badly wrong actually um, white should be better there but it is very tricky indeed because white, white's king is not altogether safe anyway Zhang decided to play rook e1 instead but he who hesitates could be lost and with b5 Ding took the initiative. The knight came back to d2, rook d8. Yeah, that's a little bit vulnerable. And now Zhang went for it with knight e4. So he's yeah, trying to spin this knight round to f6. Rook takes d4. Now, white is able to win that rook with a check. Bishop takes and then queen takes d4. The reason I wanted to show this game, but I mean, I think it's a very interesting game in itself, is that there are distinct similarities with one of the games from the World Championship match. If you remember the French defense that Ding played there, and we actually, we've actually arrived at a very similar position. I'll show you that game. I'll just remind you of that game right at the end. Rook d8, good move. So that rook hitting the queen and through the queen, the bishop as well. Zhang was intent on attacking and he shifted the queen to g4. That's still a threat. Bishop takes pawn. Now, look at those two bishops. Isn't this reminiscent of game seven of the World Championship match? where Ding also sacrificed the exchange. Well, I'd hardly count this as a sacrifice, but you get the idea. Really similar. I'll come back to this uh, afterwards. So Bishop G6. So this was clearly the idea that Zhang had in mind. Um, he's, he's trying to stir things up. You know, maybe he looked at Ding's rating and thought, OK, in complications, he's going to collapse or something like that. But actually... Ding plays with a very sure hand. I mean, the idea is that if pawn takes, then white can recover material. Actually, I still prefer black here. You know, this... I think black has, has some winning chances here. Whether you can win is another matter, but you know, look, at, look at this. I guess the problem is that this bishop actually is a little bit insecure. If you could just protect that with another pawn, that would be a different matter. Anyway, after bishop g6, in fact, there's a much better move than taking. Rook d4, which pushes the queen to a really poor square. And then simply retreating the bishop. So that blocks the f-file. And here's what happened. Rook c1. Queen just stepped out of the way. Bishop came back. And now an absolute killer move. In fact, this move uh, was quite a theme in that World Championship game where black suddenly swings over from the d-file and this is horrible. So white has to give up material and then shift the queen. But now ding is two pawns up and he managed to keep control very well. G6. Oh yeah, incidentally, in, the, in this position, I mean, checking just doesn't lead to anything because the king is completely safe on e7. That's, that's the beauty of having four pawns in front of your king, not just three. So rook g1, g6 just closes things up and the rest of the game was pretty straightforward. And indeed at the end White didn't even reach an endgame, which would be miserable. 
Um, so this mate threatened. And as is so often the case in these kind of positions where black has a pawn majority and white just has a couple of pawns, in fact, it's white's king that really suffers. Queen f2. As indeed, um, Nepo should have actually lost that game. So queen f2, that's that's the end of the show. Um, if, well, for example, if rook g2, I mean, here, Zhang resigned. If rook g2, then we could give a check. And that'll do nicely. That's checkmate. Yeah, just a quick reminder of that world championship game. Let's come to move 24. So this is where uh, Ding had just sacrificed the exchange and you see the similarities here. Queen and two bishops attacking white's king side and also look at those four pawns in front of the king and Ding moved to the D file and had superb compensation here even after the exchange of bishops. On rook d5 I think Ding had in mind the rook h5 swing when he played this and well Ding had excellent chances to uh, win this game. So I just thought it was interesting that you know you can see similarities between these games and also that game was from an absolute landmark tournament in Ding's career. Let's just have the final position on the board again. This Chinese Championship 2009 and I do want to show you at least one more game from that tournament uh, because Ding played some fantastic chess. Don't forget there'll be more Ding videos, old Ding videos that I've recorded that you can find on the community tab. So go to the main channel page on YouTube, youtube.com PowerPlayChess, click on the community tab and you'll find daily videos, new videos there. Uh, well, I say new videos, old videos that I've recorded of Ding's games and I'll post new ones there every day. Thanks for watching.